So in this first part, I'm going to help you see why you need to dive into Generations Ultimate and give it a spin, especially if you're looking for something to scratch that Monster Hunter itch and maybe you've already burned out on Iceborne. I have to give a shout out to Fred aka Slam for continuing to recommend that I give Gen U a try all that time ago. From the mechanics to the monster roster and styles, I'll give you a little bit of an inside look to one of the best games I've ever played, not just in a Monster Hunter sense, hands down. The Monster Hunter series is ridiculously good at keeping the core of its franchise in each iteration while still keeping things fresh and introducing game-altering mechanics. When you look at the things like mounting, if you're transitioning to Monster Hunter 4 or for you, you'd be blown away by the fact that you could actually mount a monster. Just think of how game-changing that is. Even in instances of Gen Yu to Worldborn, they took things a step further by introducing a Clutch Claw mechanic. Now, the Clutch Claw mechanic is definitely a polarizing one to say the least. Even though they definitely put too much reliance on the Clutch Claw, the way that it took the core gameplay and twisted it just enough to make it fresh, different, and unique is a testament to what Monster Hunter is as a series. Fresh, unique, and it keeps you wanting more. Not only is it fun to go forward from one game to another, but it's a blast to go backwards and see just how far they've improved things from title to title. And it's actually pretty fun to see too how some of the older titles do things better than their later iterations. Not only that, but it really makes you appreciate just how advanced or mechanically sound a game may have been for its time or its platform. This is where Gen Yu comes in with flying colors. Right off the bat, I'm talking in terms of the Switch port. It runs so damn good on the Switch. You would hardly be able to tell that this was a DS port. That, of course, is when we're talking about gameplay and flow. Now, I know that as of right now, Worldborn is kind of like the pinnacle of smooth flowing combat, almost to a fault to some people, but you truly can't help but play Gen Yu and think, was this really on a DS before? I haven't had a single hunt go down where I wasn't thoroughly impressed with the monsters or the flow of the hunt. Now, of course, when we talk about previous titles, you're obviously going to notice some quality of life changes. Immediately, I notice just how much I appreciate the radial menu of Worldborn, not only in the sense of using items, but crafting them as well. I noticed how much I missed it even more now that I started to get into Gen U gunner weapons. But the point of me bringing up the quality of life changes is to show just how much it helps you to appreciate them when you play previous titles. If you never had to go through the experience of paintballing a monster, or in my case forgetting to paintball the monster, you'll never truly understand just how different it is having the monsters on the map with World Born and Rise. We could easily go over plenty of quality of life changes from the paintballing to getting rid of zones, but the thing we should do above all else is give props to games like Gen U for pushing the boundaries and helping to bring to the forefront what changes were needed, while being an extremely fun journey to play through as well. Now, just because Generations Ultimate is an older title, doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of things that it does arguably better than Worldborn. One of the things that I'm not a huge fan of in Worldborn is the fact that it feels like there's an extreme need to stack damage skills or you're sacrificing too much. We know the holy trinity of crit eye, crit boost, and weakness exploit. You see them in just about 99.9% .9 of builds in random lobbies. And let me just get out in front of this ahead of time. If your version of fun is building the absolute max damage you can, or optimizing your build to do the most damage it can, that's 800% okay. I, myself, do the same from time to time, but I much more prefer to switch things up and put my own spin on things. I don't like stacking nothing but damage. I love survivability skills, utility skills, etc. If you've been part of this channel for a while, you know the absolute pure love that I have for the skill Evade Extender, and I'll sing its glory every chance I get. Generations Ultimate was like a playground for people who love to optimize builds to the T, while simultaneously nudging people to invest or round out skills they may not have thought of originally. With the point system of Gen Yu, if you were left with extra slots in your armor, you might slot in a deco or two to finish up that Evade Extender or Vault and bring it up to a 10. I went into Gen Yu pretty blind and spent most of my time just messing around with builds when I got a little deeper into the hub quest, and that's honestly how I found out about the Deadeye skill. I only needed a point to bring it to 10 and came to find out that it's pretty useful and a critical skill for gunners. I had a bit of a backwards journey since I ended up playing Worldborn first, then trekking back to Gen Yu. 
It's safe to say that I much prefer the armor system of Gen Yu, minus the split between Blade Master and Gunner armors, because it really makes you put some serious effort into making your build. The beautiful thing about this is that even though it takes more effort to get the build that you want, when you finally do, it's much more gratifying and you feel super powered. Part of the reason it feels harder and as a result much more gratifying is the fact that there are also negative values on some things, whether it's armor or decorations. This makes it so you can't just jam in every skill that you want without consequence. You want to throw in some agitator into your lance build? Well, you better take into consideration that agitator decorations give you a minus one in your guard skill. Speaking of decorations, another boost this armor skill system has is the fact that decorations are craftable while charms, also known as talismans in Gen Yu, are the pieces that are subject to RNG. Believe me, I get that RNG is RNG, but having all these slots in your armor and being able to craft the specific decos that you need feels much better than grinding out some deco quests and praying that you get that guard up or mighty bow decoration you need so bad. Don't get me wrong, making builds is a very fun thing to do whether we're talking Worldborn or Gen Yu, but it feels like a much more open and versatile adventure when you dive into a build in Gen Yu. If you gave me an ultimatum and made me pick one single aspect of Gen Yu that I love the most and is the main reason I implore people to play the game, it would absolutely be weapon styles. There are the 14 weapons, of course, but when you throw the six different weapon styles in as well, you technically have 84 different weapon and style combos to work with. In some cases, the styles don't drastically change the weapon, but in some cases, it definitely does. Aerial Dual Blades will see you launch into the air and then turning into a heat-seeking blender that someone threw out of a third story building. If you switch to Valor Dual Blades though, you become a guard point savant that can regain sharpness and can even play more aggressively. If you're a longsword user, the different styles all have fun new ways to get through your spirit combo. Hell, Valor even removes your white, yellow, and red gauges altogether and replaces it with a new blue level that's slightly less powerful than red. When you take into consideration just how many different style and weapon combinations there is, it can seem a bit overwhelming. And believe me, that's a pretty solid overview of things with Gen Yu. There's so much to do. I myself like to play every weapon and switch things up from time to time, even though my tried and trusted hunting horn is always a go-to. But even if you're the type of person who typically sticks to one weapon type, you can splash in a little variety or spice things up by changing to another style. Gaijin has an absolutely incredible series of weapon reviews for Gen Yu that also goes over the styles and the intricacies they introduce for each weapon. I'll give you a quick overview View, but if you have a weapon that you like and want to know more specifically about the info, hit up Gaijin's series. Guild is going to usually be your straight this is how the weapon plays style. You rarely lose any of the moves that you've come to love, but you also rarely gain anything spicy. You get two hunter arts as well, so you can classify Guild as versatile for sure. Striker is more the style to play if you want to go heavy on the hunter arts, which we'll be going over in part 2. You get three of them and depending on the weapon you use, there can be some pretty sick synergy to make this style extremely powerful. For example, Switch Axe has the hunter art where you can go into a super powerful state with your sword and do increased damage, but your gauge decreases over time. Pair this with the other hunter art that immediately refills your gauge and you have some sweet synergy that will see you wreck face. Aerial is a pretty straightforward style, although it affects weapons differently in the way it achieves the goal of mounting the monster. Your main goal with Aerial is just that of course, but it always changes the way weapons work and in some cases it's pretty drastic. For example, the longsword in Aerial style has a much easier time getting to the red gauge. You cannot go into your spirit slash combo while on land, but after you successfully vaulted off of a monster, and as soon as you land, you can go into the combo. To get into your white gauge, I believe it takes three slashes, but after that, getting into yellow and red will literally only take one spirit slash once you've landed on the ground. Yep one single spirit slash to increase your gauge. Adept is one that also throws in some drastic changes. You gain the ability to dodge through attacks and literally take zero damage. You also gain some cool tricks up your sleeve to unleash after those adept dodges. Some of my favorite weapons with adept are the sword and shield that actually let you leap into the air and do mounting damage on a monster, giving it insane utility to pair with that adept dodge. My beloved hunting horn gains an awesome trick that will see you able to chain three notes 
in rapid succession after the dodge, making buffing a hell of a lot faster. If you're someone who's a fan of the Soul series and rolling through attacks, Adept would be a very good place for you to start in Generations Ultimate. Valor brings in a unique mechanic that lets you brace for an attack before sheathing your weapon to see you take only 30% damage. It also gives you a Valor gauge to fill, and once you do so, you go into Valor mode and you'll gain some pretty powerful moves and mechanics. Keep in mind that with most weapons, while you're out of Valor mode, you won't have access to some pretty key moves. A good example is one of the most potent weapon and style combos, the Valor Heavy Bowgun. Once you've gotten into Valor mode, you gain the ability to go into what is called Siege mode. You can chain fire certain ammos, depending on the bowgun that you're using, and do some astronomical damage. Alchemy, admittedly, is a style that I haven't played a lot of, so I can't go too in depth. It gives you ample opportunity to buff up your teammates through a barrel gauge that you fill up over time. You can send yourself and your teammates into vastly improved SP modes, and you can even create items with great utility, such as temporary earplugs for monster roars. Check out Gaijin's video for this one for sure, because I definitely can't do it justice on just how useful it can be. Take all of those brief descriptions as just a peek into the potential each weapon and style has. I could go on and on for days, but we have other things that that we need to talk about too. I'll throw up a list of my favorite styles for each weapon before we move on. One of the things that became more and more glaringly obvious the further I made my way through Gen Yu was the ridiculously large and varied roster of monsters. Now, before I go too far, I have to give a spotlight to a monster that you encounter extremely early, but never gets a lot of spotlight. Great Macau is such an awesome starting monster. It really does a great job of teaching newcoming players that you can't just come into the game and mash buttons and expect to be able to take down a monster, not even the very first monster that you hunt. But the monsters just get more and more impressive as you continue to go down the roster. It's an absolutely fantastic progression of difficulty that keeps you engaged without it ever feeling like there's too much of a challenge or a power creep. You have your typical monsters that are there to annoy the hell out of you like Gypsaros or Nibble Snarf, but it makes it all the more worth it to get through those hunts because there's so many monsters that aren't just cool on their own, but they're extremely fun hunts as well. I didn't mind getting flashed or my item stolen from Gypsaros because Later I got to fight the fun, unique monster that is Nursilla. A fun little thing for you to check out whether you're new to Gen Yu or a vet. Check out how Nursilla acts after it puts you to sleep. It kind of twitches and checks to make sure you aren't moving. I didn't mind having to go through what I find to be one of the more annoying hunts for Nibble Snarf because I got to dodge all over the place and was kept on my toes going against the Slicer Dicer, the absolute badass looking Seregios. There's a monster here for everyone. You of course have the series staples like Rathalos, along with very familiar faces like Diablos. But these monsters get a special treatment that I think is one of the coolest alterations that they've done to a monster. Deviants not only look different, they have seriously altered movesets that turn the typical hunts against a Rathalos and Diablos upside down on their heads. Bloodbath Diablos, or Massacre Diablos, is a Diablos that has survived hunters trying to take him out. It's incredible how they implement this fact into the hunt itself. I don't want to give away everything, but it's so awesome how they give it a move to where it will roar, knowing it will stagger the hunter, it cancels out of that roar early and charges for the hunter, making it very hard to dodge that attack. Whether or not people like the old system of leveling up these deviants is definitely a discussion that can be had, but it's pretty much undeniable that the deviants were a fun and very clever way of bringing new life to some new and returning monsters. And we haven't even gotten to the Faded Four, or the Elite Four if you're a Pokemon fan. These monsters are some of the coolest you'll find in the series, and they were all introduced in Gen Yu. You have a lightning-infused, dragonfly-esque, dive-bombing, flying wyvern in Astalos, an iced-out, humongous woolly mammoth that sucks you in with its trunk in Gameth, a water-spraying, bubble-shooting, fox-looking monster that most people are likely familiar with after the Rise demo in Mizutsune, and finally what I thought was a standout in Worldborn, the tail-sword-swinging, fire-spewing, Ravenous Glavinous. And each of these monsters just get even better and more challenging with their deviant counterparts. 
You of course have your elder dragons like Teostra and Kushala Deora that come in to bring you quite the challenge and keep you hunting during the endgame stages. There is one elder dragon that I found to be pretty polarizing in the Monster Hunter community, but I found its fight to be unique, fun, and engaging, but I'll let you find out who that is on your own. Endgame hunts are extremely varied and aren't just boxed into the Elder Dragon framework. Hyper versions of early stage monsters like Ludroth and Kecha help to keep them relevant and surprisingly give some of these monsters endgame viable or even top tier weaponry that I find myself creating even after being in the 200s in HR rank. It's very safe to say that you'll have plenty of awesome and challenging monsters to keep you engaged until Rise comes out. Oh, and don't worry, there's some big bad black dragons ready to frustrate the hell out of you too. But that's going to be it for part one. If you think I've been gushing over Gen U right now, you really ain't seen nothing yet. Discord and Patreon links are in the description below if you want to join our awesome community and support the channel. I wanted to give a shout out to my patrons, Sky Blue Brad, Christian Mingle, Keith Koala, and Al. Through saving up their monthly contributions and their donations, I was able to get the capture card that was used to get the footage for this video and helps me to stream awesome games like Gen U and eventually Rise. This channel is fueled by the awesome community we created and I'll forever be thankful for that. Comment below why you think people need to give Gen U a spin. Subscribe if you haven't already for more Monster Hunter, Gen U, and other gaming content. Streams, reviews, guides, and more. Have a good night, happy hunting, and I'll see you guys in the next video.